Deep in our galaxy, everyday citizens noticed something no one has ever seen before. A distant star, for some reason, dimmed significantly before returning to its usual brightness. And then it happened again and again. There is no other star quite like it in the night sky, and scientists still aren't certain what is causing this event. Today we explore what is called the most mysterious star in the universe, Tabby's star. This is Red Web. This is one small step for Red Web. One giant leap for mystery enthusiasts. Welcome back, Task Force, to Red Web. I am so excited. We talk about mysteries, the unsolved, the supernatural, the paranormal. Let's get it all out of the way. I'm just excited that we're talking about space. Just like the Fast series, we're in space now, baby. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I am so excited. If you are, uh, you know, uh, I have a listener, you know that I just keep going. Ooh, mm -hmm, anything mm -hmm. that has to do with space, go tink tickle my interests. Oh, yeah. I'm your rocket man for the evening, Trevor Collins. Joining me, my co-pilot, looking out the window, fogging up the glass and putting little ha passionate baby handprints on it. Alfredo Diaz. I'm strapped in. A uh, number of things shooting in my head. Yeah, it yeah. It could be the way the different gases react on that sun. Ooh. Uh, it could be a planet that occasionally passed by. Oh. Uh, it could be a shower of meteors. It could be aliens. Could be blinking. Maybe you're just out there blinking. Yeah, <laughs> could be a fake sun. Who knows? But I'm excited because oh, we're yeah. in space. I'm very excited. And so for this one, and, and this is a rare occasion for me where I go in unprepared. I'm very eager. I've heard about this. I haven't gone into the details, but as you know, my background is aerospace engineering. And so I love me a little bit of space. I'm not an astronomer. So I, I know a little bit about this and that's, but I'm very eager to jump in with my gut check and see what's going on. But yeah, we have a, a star in the night sky that significantly dimmed only to return back to its normal brightness, the lumens, and it kind of kept doing that. And I believe it wasn't on a regular cadence, which kind of interferes with potentially some of those theories. It would. Yes, you know. it would. All right. Without further ado, let's dive into the history of it, the discovery of this star. Since at least 1890, Tabby's star has been observed in the constellation Cygnus. Cygnus is the cross-shaped constellation that can be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. It is about 1,470 light years from Earth, and if you want to put that into miles, you know, God's measurement, one light year is about six trillion miles. Damn! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! It, a light year is so, I mean, listen, by definition, it's how far light can go in a year. Light's pretty fast. Light is very what fast. What is it, three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared? Not squared, but meters per second. Sure. Oh, it's, it, it's, <laughs> it's as fast as... look baffled. Yeah, why? Let me yeah, just pull sounds, this one out. sounds it, right. I would wager light's as fast as a 96 Plymouth. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back. Probably a dark green <laughs> to be specific. Bring it back. Now, I'm bringing it forward. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but Tabby's star... Because scientists are brilliant, have been able to figure this out, it is 1.43 times the mass of the sun. So about 43% bigger than our life giver. So Tabby's star is what is known as an F-type star. Any star that's 1 to 1.4 times the mass of our star is considered an F-type. They're brighter, and they're over a thousand degrees in Kelvin hotter than our sun. Jeez, and I'm sure the gravitational pull is tremendous comparatively. Yeah. I don't know if gravitational pulls, oh God, Doesn't I don't want to think about equations, but I don't know if, if gravity scales linearly. Oh God, now we're getting into <laughs> So I don't know if, 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 it, if the mass is 1.43 times, I imagine maybe the gravity is 1.43 times. Yeah, if it's linear, like, I got, like a one for one I got one dusty thing. physics memory yeah, yeah, right for now. Sure. It's like I got to dust it off and look at the old expired textbook in my brain. For sure. But yeah, no, it would definitely have more gravity, like a higher pull for sure. With the launch of the Kepler Space Telescope back in 2009, scientists were finally able to take a close look at it and study it. Space telescopes operate in space via remote control from Earth, and the reason why one does that is because ground-based telescopes have to look through our atmosphere, which, if you've ever gone out on a hot night, clear sky, you look at the stars and they kind of flicker, yeah. that's just the atmospheric effects. And so you can imagine just a very thin layer of atmosphere oh. has, has that much of an effect when you start 
telescoping through it. You got like it's a gonna FedEx magnify. plane flying by and everything right. like that. You're like, what is that? Is that a smudge? There's a bug on the lens, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Bird pooped on the lens. But yeah, and so that's why you have uh, telescopes that go up to space. You monitor from afar. They're essentially in a vacuum. And then you also have now the fancy James Webb Space Telescope. It's at Lagrange Point. Is it L1 or L3? Or am I just, once again, wrong? Just one of those, uh, basically, geostatic orbits that's just out there. Constantly surveying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Figure eight pattern of... Yeah. I don't know how Lagrange points work, uh, obviously but they're, they're they've cool. Obviously, wor- they've worked around this, and it's in a... You know, they, when they launch these drones and satellites... These cameras, they're, they're within a capsule and whatnot. How annoying would it be to launch something and then just there's like a smudge on the lens? Ooh, uh, just, <laughs> let me take you back. Probably has some kind of a wiper built in. I feel like, I don't remember the exact <laughs> issue off the top of my head. Hubble had something like that. They had to go up and fix it. Oh my um, God. Because it That's was essentially so expensive. It was, yeah, it was like out of focus or something. It was basically inoperable or, or, or unusable in that sense. But yeah, they had to go up and fix it. Um, and then. The same fear happened with the James Webb Space Telescope because they'd aligned things up and I think it it took a couple bumps. Well, first on Earth, it was dropped. Okay. And then second well, in space, you know, it's gonna like get hit by a few pellets and things, but yeah. everything worked out. Everything's fine. Jump to the chase. But yeah, it's in a place where it can't be operated on for sure. Did answer your question, yeah, the yeah. James Webb telescope is at the second Lagrange L2. point. L two. L2. Got it. I'll just know next time it's somewhere between the numbers I asked. (laughs) And then I'll ask you again. Two or three. So coming back to Kepler, this is 2009. In Kepler's catalog, the star is labeled something organic, something that you would anticipate, like KIC 8462852. Starting in 2011, the Citizen Science Network Planet Hunters noticed something strange about KIC 8462852. Tabby star. Yeah, that's a lot. Citizen scientists are researchers from the general public, often called amateur scientists, that basically study the night sky. A lot of discoveries have been from amateurs or people just kind of looking up at the stars, making their assessments, and then watching over the following months to see how things change. Because obviously, the night sky is nigh infinite. You can look any which way, yeah. and it and it has a certain depth to it, and so you can't keep people from looking either, right? And so it's a really cool thing to have. Uh, so it's kind of like an Armageddon situation. Here, well, where maybe, the guy maybe spotted not, well, the asteroid. And, oh, I, I see. Uh, ahead of time yeah, here, yeah. I saw the dimming star coming right at us. Yeah, and, and then Bruce he was Willis. yelling at his wife to get the book with all the NASA names. Like, get the book, get the book, get John NASA on the phone. Yeah, yeah, you know. Planet Hunters was led by Yale University's Deborah Fisher, and they were looking for exoplanets. Basically small planet toys just outside the solar system that we may or may not have seen before. Basi- I, I love the fact that there is so much in space that we have it, a lot of it categorized. You know, we have potential doomsday meteors, trajectories like figured out and everything. But sometimes, whether it be exoplanets just way out past the Kuiper belt, or you have little meteors that get thrown in, to the solar system, so many of them aren't even known about until they're like right there. So it's pretty cool that we have a lot of people looking out for that stuff. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's just so much to cover and Mm -hmm. you can only see so far. And (laughs) E.T.'s got to be on one of them. Like facts. Just riding? Yeah. Okay. He's just riding a rock. I was about to say, riding a rock. (laughs) He used to ride these puppies for miles. (laughs) So they're looking for exoplanets, which was also just, by the way, Kepler Telescope's main purpose, just in case any of Kepler's computers miss them, you have human redundancy, which is a very scientific thing. Exoplanets, just for the sake of making this very entry-level friendly to everybody, they're planets outside the solar system. Exo and planet. So, in 2015, astronomer Dr. Tabitha S. Boyajin and her fellow researchers published a paper using the Planet Hunter's data, as well as the, their own team's research. They found that the star, strangely, oh, this is, these are the numbers I like, they would periodically dim up to 22%, though these periods are unpredictable. 22% is not a joke for a star to dim like almost a quarter of its brightness. That's a lot. And it's unperiodic. Stars do dim and brighten over the course of their lifetime. However, it is usually not detectable on Earth. And if it is, it's usually, for context, about a 1% change. So we're talking huge comparatively. And the fact that you can see it from, from Earth, like I said, when you look up, the atmospheric effects kind of make it flicker anyway. So the fact that this is over the course of maybe, I don't know, I'm not there in the outline yet, Christian, but do you know if this took over the course of days or hours, this dimming? 
I don't want to spoil anything. Okay, don't spoil it. That's okay. <laughs> He's trying to think how to answer. That's, that's my my that's curious. All we we'll we'll that's get all to it. it. That's we'll all I need. Okay. <laughs> my curious brain is, like, is trying to dig in. Like, could it possibly be that the sun is turning into a dwarf or like? It could be, yeah. It could be but then various. It got brighter again. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it could there's be in its various stages of dying. Is what I'm trying to say. It's totally possible. For example, Betelgeuse, the tenth brightest star in our night sky, famously dimmed back in 2019, but has since returned to its normal original brightness. And it was theorized that this was due to it being near death. Essentially, upon looking closer, scientists were able to figure out that it had blown up a chunk of material. And that then created the dimness that we saw, but otherwise, like, the fusion properties of the sun that keep the thing kindled kind of came back to life. But it's otherwise, like you're saying, it's it's sputtering out a little yeah. bit. Betelgeuse, by the way, I'm sure you've all seen it many times. If you know the constellation Orion, as looking at it, it's the upper left. So Orion's right shoulder should be quite red and also very bright. So it usually is one of the first stars you'll see as the night dawns. Another thing that's worth noting, newborn stars' brightness fluctuate a lot due to the tight disk of dust left over from its formation. And so, because that's what a star is, a bunch of dust gathers until there's enough pressure that a fusion reaction can naturally happen, which then can sustain itself. Matter just crushes in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And anyway, that's a very simplified version. And because of that, if it's just formed, you're still going to have that accretion disk, I think it's called, but of like dust whizzing around the star and that's going to be ununiform, not something like the ring around Saturn that's quite uniform. But all planets, all spherical items in space have that until those disks either in the stake of a star turn into planets or in the stake of a planet turn into a moon or sometimes just a ring. So cool. Yeah. So the paper discussing this research, Dr. Tabitha S. Boyajian's research and the Planet Hunters data, that stuff, kind of led to the star getting a name that wasn't its... Uh, numerical abbreviation, but instead it became known as Tabby's star, but also sometimes referred to as Boyajian's star. It also is sometimes called the WTF star based on the paper name Where's the Flux? What? Oh, okay. <laughs> Different WTF. Uh, yeah. Those Sorry scientists, you know, they're, they're coy. <laughs> Essentially, something appears to be irregularly blocking the light from Tabby's star from our view here on planet Earth. Scientists don't know what is causing the dimming or why it has such irregular periods. Because if, if it was a giant planet or anything in orbit, as you can imagine, our years are very, like we have a calendar and a clock based on our orbit. That's how regular it is, unless you're talking about millions or billions of years on a time scale. So if it was something orbiting the star, even a cluster of dust, one could imagine that to be periodic, as in it happens every X days or X time period but it's not seeming to happen that way. Yeah, there would be like a rotation that mm -hmm. you could track. Even if it was off an axis and it took longer between days or whatever it is, you could still be able to track it because the gravity would lock it in and rotate over and over and over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Tabby Star would have a dimming event once a year. Then later on, it would have multiple events within months of each other. Sometimes light would fade slowly. Oh, this is okay. This is where it is. Other times, it would be more abrupt. Sometimes it can be as slow and abrupt in the same dimming event. Wow. What? So these events can last between 5 and 80 days. So there's, okay, there's the, there's the answer this I'm looking for. This star is all over the place. <laughs> so, okay. So the reason why I wanted to go in was because I wanted to go firing and ablazing on all these theories, because we're going to get into the theories and they're big and juicy. But, yeah. But like... This is fascinating. But I, what would go, I don't know that they're I'm, irregular, but they keep happening. But they're highly irregular, and they dim a lot. So something's there. You can imagine where we're heading with this. There's got to be a theory on aliens. I, oh, there's 100. If, if, if there wasn't, if there wasn't, this would be the one where I'd be pissed. I would be pissed. <laughs> genuinely pissed. I'm like, are you kidding me? We'll we, we've out. had cold cases and all that kind of stuff, and you know, you throw in aliens there, and we don't throw in aliens here. I have no, granted, I'll say it again. I know nothing about nothing. I have no idea how, like, what would cause that? Like, I'm so intrigued to get into, like, the theories. Because uh -huh, uh -huh. I know it's going to get juicy, yeah. thick with science and knowledge. And I'm just not buff enough to oh, understand all that. Oh, yeah, I hope you've been that. doing your stretches task force because we're going to make you ripped on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Get ready to put on the pounds. 
Well, I've got a few, man, this is a throwback. They look like a couple of, and this is for my engineer geeks out there, a couple of MATLAB graphs. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> you laugh all you want. The brilliant minds of the world just went, mm-hmm, and we all just... Right, we and all I just, ain't one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so we really shook uh-huh. hands. No, we have a couple of graphs uh, going over the dimness and some of the events here, and then a little bit more information to trickle your way, Fredo, and then we're diving straight into the, uh, the theories, because there's a lot to talk about with okay. the theories. All right, so, okay, let me, let me look at these graphs. The x-axis is time, I believe, in days, and then the y-axis is the normalized flux. I, I imagine that's normalized, meaning the brightness of the star is normalized to one. One for one is the brightness. And so when it dips down, you get a relation to how much it's, it's uh, dimming. For example, one of the simple ones here starts about day 786, and then by 793, it's dimmed pretty uniformly. Like, oh, it's like a log curve. Like, exponentially dips down to like 85, 0.85. So about a 15% dip. Only to shoot right back up the next day or two. Some of these look like heartbeats. Take a look. You see? So, okay, so one looks very smooth. Dips right down at 15%. Shoots right back up with an exponential curve. Mm. Some of them are very like like a heart rate monitor kind of jagged going up and down on the way down. Yeah. Like so, like investing in Nvidia. Yeah, yeah. Trevor like like Trevor made like a very good like assessment of what it looked like. Mm-hmm. Let me just go ahead and break it down for you. You got like a line that's going across from the left to the right, okay? <laughs> and you got like a graph. So like you got that x y axis. I uh-huh, forget which uh-huh. one goes up and which one goes horizontally. X goes horizontal. There you go. <laughs> so that's what we're that's what we're starting with, okay? Yeah, task yeah, force. Yeah. And then you got some lines. As that line goes horizontally across, okay, you got some dips. And then just like life, when it dips, it just goes back up eventually. When it dips, so, it rips. And so okay. it'll go up and then dip. But these like these like bottom dips, like they they like pretty long. Like they'll go all the way to the bottom of that graph. And that graph starts like pretty high, like maybe like ninety <laughs> percent on the height of the graph. You know what I'm saying? And then you got other little graphs here that you break it down. Some of these dips look like. Like one kind of looked like between just like a like a booty crack that's like <laughs> wide open. You know what I mean? You, like, you like, described like, it in two <laughs> words better than I described like it. A booty you, crack. Went, you went booty crack. And I went, that's a booty that's crack. That. And yeah. then the other one just looked like you just like, booty cracks you, getting like, to know each you're other. You're on a wave of emotions when it comes to stocks. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but mostly you've had some big big losses, but you stuck with it. And now you because broke in even. the beginning you're good, and at the end you broke even. Yeah, that's the graph. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. All right. Boom. Now that you have all those vivid <laughs> mental pictures, I was waiting for you to be like, mm, this looks like a mountain range on the horizon. Mm, mm-hmm. This one looks a little bit like uh, Tokyo from a distance. <laughs> 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 all right. Enough fun. Okay. Time to get back to serious. Whatever's blocking the light, they say, cannot be a planet. And that would probably be because, before I read further, the irregularity of it, the fact that yeah. the one that looks like a booty crack, no joke, has a very, very smooth exponential decline before hitting the bottom and basically bouncing back up it's and a, an exponential it's a, return. And it's just like a replicated, like, yeah, like on both sides, like the, the, the it looks way. Like a little like a Tesla logo, if I'm really trying to give you that mental yeah, image. true. For example. Very precise. Absolutely. On the drop. Mm-hmm. Let's give an example. This is a good one. The planet size of, of about Jupiter would only block 1% of the light from Tabby's star. And so if this is a planet, boy, does it have a wild, oh, big, big, big planet, wild orbit. So whatever this is, if it is something physical around that star, it's got to be about 20 times the size of Jupiter or about a thousand times the size of Earth, or, or it's just a lot closer. Like that something consistently is blocking only that star between us and it. Oh, I didn't think it could be a series of things, like mm-hmm. a chain of things blocking it. Yeah, but also could it be a giant planet that has a plethora of moons rotating in its own type of orbit, and then from there, it's just I don't know the timing is all over the place. But then even then, I feel like you could be able to calculate some type of rhythm. I like you going. How about this? But wait, (laughs) (laughs) you know I don't man. Space is big. That's all. That's all I gotta say. Space is big. Space be big. (laughs) Space be big. So most large planets are only about the, like twice the size of Jupiter in our galaxy. And it's worth noting this star is in our galaxy. And they don't get much larger than that. It's kind of like a, an observed rule. 
It's not that planets couldn't be... It's just what, from what we've seen. But yeah, I, I guess like once you get that large, they're gas giants. And then once they get even larger than that, they might be inclined to become stars. They might dis kind of destabilize the solar system they're in. They could f like end up... I don't know, I'm just theorizing, but they could end up becoming rogue planets or whatever. But whatever it is, for some reason, planets don't get much larger than that. So again, that's why they're kind of eliminating the idea of a planet... So in Boyajian's paper, Planet Hunters X, Where's the Flux? They confirm that the flux is not caused by any glitch of the telescope. Since Dr. Boyajian's paper, much more research has been done on Tabby's star, which we will discuss in detail in the theories. Oh, okay. Jillian was get, like teasing me there for a second. That's my job for the task force. Now I get to see what it's like on your end, Fredo. <laughs> so new theories are appearing all of the time from astronomers, scientists, and even the astronomy community. I love to hear that. Hello there, audience. Once again, parting the seas of the mystery to talk directly to those eardrums. And let me just say, while I still have some voice in me, I am on the back end of RTX. And boy, did I have such a great time meeting all the task force members, the people that came out to the annual meeting of the minds, everybody that conquered or was torn asunder in the escape room, everybody that bought those movie posters and bought the Red Web Pictures shirt so you can join our actual existing, we're real, film department. You're a crew member now. Thank you sincerely, everybody that came out to RTX. It was so awesome to see everybody. I had such a good time. I lost so much sleep because I just stayed up doing all the things. My voice is hanging on by a thread. Oh, it was just so nice to sit down on the case files set, be able to chat with everybody, see what's going on in everyone's lives. And, uh, oh, it was just refreshing. And if you weren't there, the madness that you missed in Alfredo hosting the annual meeting of the minds. It was cursed. It was awesome. It was avant-garde. It was cursed. <laughs> it was, man, it was just an amazing weekend. And I, and it's exactly why RTX is one of my favorite things we get to do every single year. And I'm so excited to see you all again next year. But with that said, there's not much else I want to say. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. But if you weren't able to make it, no harm, no worries. You're still a task force member. And I'm so, so appreciative of having you in our community, sharing our podcast, reviewing it, just hanging out, listening to us. If you hear my voice right now, thank you for listening to Red Web and making us a part of your life. I am so completely completely humbled by the amount of people that listen to us on the way to work, listen to us at work, listen to us while they do chores around the house, listen to us while they fall asleep, wake up, listen again for the details. It is just amazing to see how Red Web has crept into everyone's lives and it is just extraordinary. And I am so incredibly grateful that this little project that went from passion project to a huge part of my job is able to be done. And it materializes in such cool ways as RTX and Task Force lore and, and just all of that. So anyway, my voice is going out. So before I say anything else, thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that said, I have some fantastic sponsors to talk about. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by HelloFresh. Are you ready to dive into the world of farm-to-table goodness? Pause for answer. I heard you all and you all said yes, and that's great because HelloFresh has you covered. With every HelloFresh box, you'll experience the absolute best in farm-fresh ingredients. I mean, we're talking ingredients hand-picked at the peak of ripeness. Oh, juicy tomato. And delivered straight from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days, ensuring that everything is fresh and tasty. It's like having a farmer's market right at your fingertips, except you don't have to go out into that hot Austin sun. If you were here during RTX, you know how hot it gets. But anyway, that farmer's market right at your fingertips, it's ready to go. It's ready to tantalize your taste buds with unbeatable flavors. Plus, you can say goodbye to the stress of figuring out what to cook for dinner because HelloFresh has mouthwatering chef-crafted recipes and fresh ingredients delivered right to your door. They even have options for different dietary needs. Calorie smart, okay? We're talking protein smart lunch and dinner options. We got vegan meals. We have everything. I have greatly enjoyed HelloFresh. I know you've heard me talk about it, Task Force, but I really enjoy how tasty it is every single time. I used to be a picky eater. They've really helped me expand my repertoire, what my taste buds will accept as tasty flavor. I mean, I'm eating things through these meals that I would have otherwise might not have considered. It's Every single time, I'm telling you, it's been delicious. It's always fresh, and I learn a little bit more about how to cook. And my favorite part, I get to skip the grocery store. I hate the grocery store. It's anxiety-inducing, 
and I can just hang at home and the food comes to me. It's really, really nice. If you like that, go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb50, that's five zero, and then use that very same code, RedWeb50, and you're going to get 50% off plus free shipping. What a deal! That's 50% off plus free shipping at HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb50 with code, that's right, RedWeb50. This episode of RedWeb is sponsored by BetterHelp. Finding balance in life can be so tough, and so can keeping healthy boundaries for yourselves. When you spend all that time giving, it can feel like you're feeling stretched thin and burned out. But therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. I really enjoy how focused BetterHelp is. Their website is super easy to use, and if you go there, there's a very simple survey, and so that way they can pinpoint your personal needs and find you the right therapist. I also greatly enjoy how easy it is to find a different therapist because that is a big part of finding success in therapy, is finding the right person, and BetterHelp, I've noticed, is great at doing that. If you're thinking about starting therapy, BetterHelp is a great option and it's easy and accessible. It's entirely online and it's designed to be convenient and flexible and they'll work around your schedule. All you got to do, like I mentioned, is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can always switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. That is tremendous and super important, like I said, if you're trying to find that right person for you. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash RedWeb. This episode of RedWeb is sponsored by Rocket Money. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? I want you to pause and actually think about this. Most Americans think that they spend around maybe $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total, hold on, drum roll please, is closer to a total of $200 a month. That's wild. Think about what your answer was and then think about that 200. Were you accurate? I'm not sure, but that's where Rocket Money can step in. If you don't know exactly how much you're spending every single month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and it helps lower your bills all in one convenient place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions that they've forgotten about and chances are you might be one of them So think about it like that one streaming app. You know, I think we've all signed up for those trials and you signed up, you watched the thing, you forgot about it, and then it converted to a full thing. And maybe now you're a year down the road and you don't even know about it. I know Alfredo uses this and it's something that keeps all of his credit cards in one convenient spot. So we can see all of his purchases, no matter what he's getting or what credit card it's on, no matter what account it is. And one of the things that I personally really enjoy about this service is that You can cancel through Rocket Money. You don't have to figure out where to cancel, how to cancel. Some of these services make it very difficult. You just say, hey, Rocket Money, could you help me out with this? And they will absolutely do it for you. They will get it canceled for you so you can save all that money and uh, go continue living your life. That is so cool. So stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash redweb. Once again, that's rocketmoney.com slash redweb. And for those of you who are still on planet Earth, hop on rocketmoney.com slash redweb. And with that, let's get right back into the mystery. Let's dive into the theories. Oh, it's a lot of theories. There's a juicy one that just starts with aliens. Hell hell yeah. (laughs) All right. So since we were just talking about it, I think it's only natural to continue the idea of a planet. I know we don't, we kind of ruled it out, but let's yeah. talk about it because there are rogue planets. There are other things happening in the 1400 light years between us and there. Maybe it's an alien space highway. We'll get there. But yeah, let's talk about planets and comets because it is a popular hypothesis that the cause of Tabby's star dimming is debris of a broken up exoplanet or a bunch of broken comets. This field of debris may be orbiting Tabby's star or simply passing by. I mean, if you look at our solar system, we have the asteroid belt Mm -hmm. between, what is it, Mars and Jupiter? Yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just wanted to double check. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Again, it's it's knowledge that's ingrained in me. I'm just going to admit it's kind of dusty. I don't (laughs) use it a lot, so I'm got to polish it up a little bit. But then on the outside of our solar system, kind of out where like Pluto's kicking it, poor lost planet baby uh, what do they call it a planetoid now what was it 
it was a planet, then it wasn't she a planet. She got downgraded. Now, now it's a planet. She came story. at us with a full on heart, like a heart emoji when we first saw her and said, Maybe I can stay a planet though, you've seen me. And they said, No, planetoid. Anyway, out where that planet's kicking it, there are a bunch of other little planetoids, but a lot. I'm talking like an Oort cloud. I think it goes 360 around our solar system, not just like a belt of just rocks and asteroids and stuff. And so I'm imagining what this theory is saying is that Tavi has something similar that might have more of a clustery nature to it. Oh. Yeah. It's a lot of frozen ice and rock. Yeah. Mm hmm So this theory, this kind of cloud of debris, this field passing by, at least from our perspective, could explain the irregularity of the dimming. Sometimes the debris would be more clustered. The density of these clumps could change due to the gravity of the star breaking the pieces, pulling them inward. I mean, that's how a lot of earthly asteroid hits are made. That's how a lot of comets are made, is that these things interfere with each other out in space. They bonk into each other, lose yeah, momentum, do. and then they fall in towards the star. And so, you know, maybe we're just witnessing the same thing happen around a different star. Interesting. However, looks like there's a wrinkle here. Oh. The NASA Spitzer Telescope would have detected infrared radiation from debris or comets, and none of that has been found. We could detect that? We can look so far back into time. What? That's, oh, I love space, man. It's mind-bending. But yeah, I guess that's that's interesting. That is true, because everything we're seeing is the past. Mm -hmm. This is traveling, so, like, light is traveling so far. Oh, man. We're looking, yeah, I we're looking it. 1,500 years ago at this star. I love it. I love it. That star could have blown up yesterday. It we could won't have, know. And we won't know for... For 1,500 for, years. <laughs> Dang! That's so cool to think about. Yeah. So... Other stars that dim similarly to Tabby's star. Oh, we're making good comparisons. Like Epic EPIC 204 278 916. We all know it. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Show plenty of infrared light, which means there are circumstellar objects like a disk similar to the rings of Saturn. This is common in very young stars where there is a lot of debris nearby as the star is forming, still pulling all that dust in, mm -hmm. still growing its mass. Tabby's star is not a young star, nor is it nearby newborn stars. So, basically, I appreciate that we posited the theory, gave all the upsides for it, all the yeah. potentials, and then said, but science, and then wiped it out. Yeah. Yeah. Dang, okay. To drive this point home, Tabby's star has been observed dimming for hundreds of years. So there would have to be a near constant shower of tens of thousands of new comets or debris, which isn't very likely. But if it was happening... God, you wouldn't want to be on a planet in that, in that system. No. Hailing every day. Bombarded. Yeah. But let's move on to the next theory. We talked about Betelgeuse, talked about its dimming. Scientists kind of said, well, that's probably part of its death throes. Yeah. Over the course of the next millennia, several millennia, it's probably going to start to show more signs of that until, I mean, stars live on the span of billions. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it could be on its deathbed for as long as humanity has been around. You know, we are our, our time, blip. humanity's time frame is but a blip. Oh, in yeah. The universe. Jeez. Oh, yeah. 13 plus billion years uh, old, this universe. And uh, I don't even think our planet's been there half the time. So let's go back to like the Betelgeuse death idea. So another theory is that Tabby star itself may be dying and thus just dimming naturally. Yeah. Every star, including the sun, eventually burns out and, quote, dies as they run out of hydrogen which would cause the star to dim. Then I could run you through, if I, if you wanted, the various phases as stars could then become all these different... Man, the way stars die isn't just a linear path to black hole where they just oh. collapse and, and then just become a blip of singularity. They could do all sorts of stuff. They could start burning yeah. up through bigger and bigger elements. Mm -hmm. And so they start to inflate. And then there's like a pressure between the inside wanting to push out and the outside wanting to push in. And then a lot of times they explode into a nebula. Sometimes they be like, they shrink way down and become like a white dwarf, white dwarf. or a quasar or, a, yeah. or all, oh man, red giant. They become all sorts of cool stuff. However, cool stuff aside, Tabby's star is not even close to the end of life. And it's likely at a stage where it should be brightening. That's interesting. How do they figure out the age of the star? They look at, man, they look at the kind of output you could look at like the, the red shift of it, basically. That'll tell you if it's moving or coming or going. And you can use that to average out what the light it's putting out is. So you can see what spectrum of light is coming out. And that'll tell you how hot it's burning, what elements it's burning, the health of it all. This is from a preliminary Google. 
Uh, it says, they determine the age of stars by observing spectrum, luminosity, and motion through space. They use that info to get a star's mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. and then they compare that to uh, past models that show what stars should look like at, you know, various ages. Hell yeah, I said uh, that in, in layman's terms. <laughs> in even more layman's terms? Oh, that's real bright. That's a young buck right there. <laughs> that's, your that's real bright. Young buck. <laughs> cool. So, Tabby star is hundreds of millions of years old, which is very young for a star. But F-type stars live to be a couple billions of years old. At the end of their lives, F-type stars tend to grow into red giants once they run out of hydrogen, and red stars are the dimmest color of star. Blue is the brightest and the hottest. Then they run onto helium. Oh man, the notes are just saying what I was wiling on about. They then run into helium once they've burned out all the oxygen, they move on to helium and eventually lose layers of that until they become a much smaller white dwarf. Yep. And it's like a really complicated equation, but it basically has to do everything with its size, how much of each of the elements it has, and how well it can sustain its own fusion reaction. Because eventually if it's too big, like... The gravity will win out and it will just implode. Yeah. And if it's smaller, it's likely to just kind of keep expanding outward and maybe just pop. If you knew that tomorrow was your last day and you had the ability to spend your, like, to go out, essentially, by being, like, catapulted into a black hole, safely, like, safely, like, into a black hole, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Once you're... Do you want to go at it or do you want to kind of orbit on in? I'm saying going at it. I guess, like, gravity would crush you, right? Say you're, say, say, say you're safely able to go into said black hole. Okay. Would you want to do that? Yes. I think so, too. I just want to see what happens, but you're not telling anyone. No, no, no. no. I mean, no one's no going to know. It's more so just like, look, I got I got, I got, got days, I got hours. Oh, I'm able to be projected in, yeah. like, into a black Let hole. Let me see that. Like, actually get into it without, like, being, like, pulverized by mm -hmm. you know, gravity and everything like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd want to see what's I'd going on. I'd be very curious. As long as time doesn't slow down so much that I become stuck <gasps> in a moment forever. I yeah, it scares me. Yeah. I'm, I'm too afraid of black holes. Do it like a supernova, throw me into just like a boiling oh. ball of fire. Yeah, I'll do oh, that. Oh, you burn up. That's yeah. a whole different... It's like cool, though. Yeah, Imagine like that true. being said at your funeral. Yeah, send off. You die. Yeah, that's rad. That's true. Black holes are terrifying. I didn't, I didn't Christian, think about that. Or at least his uh, memory. <laughs> For he was obliterated in a supernova. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Time becomes a, a whole factor there. Oh, yeah. Time, absolutely. Dude, I recently oh, rewatched Interstellar on IMAX. Man. Gotta watch it. I'll tell you this right now, though. Just in case any task force members are just jotting it down in their will and planning to go to a black hole. If you want to cross the event horizon, I greatly encourage you to look for a super massive black hole. One of those puny regular ones that might come whipping by every now and then. That thing's going to tear you apart long before Way you get before, across the event yeah. horizon. So yeah. yeah, you'll be torn down atomically. Like your atoms will be splayed out painfully. Could you imagine every nerve on in your body being on fire as you just got slowly stretched apart Yep. and you just became a string of atoms? Yeah, that would, uh, no, you have to go to a supermassive. So you can actually cross the event horizon, look left and right and go, ah, and then get torn apart where no one <laughs> yeah. can hear you scream. <laughs> All right. Ooh, this one, I, I didn't think about this one. Magnetic activity. Some scientists believe that the strong changes in the star's brightness could not be caused by something small like dust or debris, but rather the star itself. Researchers at the University of Illinois Urbana found that the fluxes could be caused by magnetic activity. The patterns were similar to avalanches and other things that experience sudden changes like sunspots, darker patches on the sun caused by magnetic flux, if you've ever seen them. These dark spots could reduce the overall brightness depending on the amount of them. Okay, so if the magnetic... I'm wondering, what if it was like the poles flipping, which is something that happens. The north and the south pole flipping, so your magnetic field goes all haywire for a short period of time. Maybe it creates, in some ways, a bunch of uh, sunspots, which makes it dim, mm -hmm. and then it like stabilizes, gets rid of the sunspots. Or... Was it just constantly flipping at that point? Maybe. That's my, I'm just guessing on top oh, yeah, of this yeah. theory. Yeah, I mean, this theory, based on magnetic activity, is just saying that Tabby Star could be experiencing sunspots. That makes a whole lot of sense. 100%. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially for sure. if it's a like a young, young buck star. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Kind of wilding out, going through puberty. You're going to get some spots. Yeah, you know? You get a little bit. I had Accutane, but oh. not, not, not enough for a sun. Mm. 
I, I can see the sun going through a whole phase before it gets hit with Accutane and levels out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Just don't pop them. You'll get sun scars. Yeah, you will. You will get sun scars. I'm curious to see if there's like a, a scientific explanation as to why that won't be, though. Right. Because, again, these are theories. So, yeah. so your gut instinct is correct. It says, however, this does not happen in a predicted way on Tabby's star. For example, the sun, a star similar in type, it's also an F-type, a little smaller, changes brightness every 11 years and only by about 1%. High resolution images are needed to confirm the magnetic flux, but we aren't sure exactly when these will be taken. I do believe that Jillian was saying that this star is on the next cycle of James Webb Space Telescope's list of things to take a closer look at. There's a bunch of things out there that need to be studied and looked at closely that James Webb would be perfect for. And so they had to make basically a list of things that would be guaranteed. Dang. This is on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because if you have such a high powered telescope, everyone wants a piece of something in the sky. Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. Take a look at that. There's an infinite amount of things to take a look at. Yeah, there's got to be a list of priorities. Dang, I didn't even think about that. It's number one on the second cycle's list. So the, whenever yeah. they do the second one, it's it's numero uno. It's the first priority. How long is the first list? One means nothing when there's right, like a thousand right, on the first. Right. So the second, seen, second pass is like second pass is like 80 years from now. Right. It's like the draft, you know, like your team picked first, but you got to wait a little you bit and watch wait. all the That's other good right. ones get picked <laughs> yep. round two. According to the Space Telescope Science Institute, it says that approximately 6,000 hours were awarded to observing programs using the full suite of the James Webb Space Telescope. I guess that means that's how many hours they're allotting for people to use the telescope? Okay. So they have like... I would assume? A total amount of hours, and maybe that's a cycle, and they'll spend however long... For cycle one, yeah, about okay. 6,000 hours. Yeah. And so some things might take like, oh, two days of staring at it to properly render the image and get enough, you know, photons to see what's going on. I think so, yeah. They, it doesn't explain in detail like what exactly the hours are spent doing, but I'm assuming it's something along the lines of what you're saying. Yeah. Fascinating. I'm very eager to see uh, what happens. It just takes one stare person at that star. out of the billions on this planet to just point the telescope in one way to spot something that is either going to change the way the human race sees itself mm -hmm. or we'll see how it ends itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's just so much pressure. God, <laughs> you, could, you could see, yeah, you could just see so much, so much, oh man, I don't know. Anyway, I, I imagine if they saw something that they couldn't share, like an alien wiping its butt or Joy riding a, a space True. motorcycle, that they'd be like, man, we got to hold on to this. Can't let the public know about well, this. That's where the government... <laughs> or like bust your door down and just, <laughs> and just like takes your all your data. Wait, they see an alien in space. Oh no! If you okay, I see. Oh, I'm just saying, like anyone as right? an amateur, as an amateur. I thought you meant James Webb Space Telescope. They see an alien. They, oh, they, they bust they, my door in. They give me your data. <laughs> like why? <laughs> we found an alien. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I want to move on. Speaking of aliens, I have heard this theory, and I and I'm very eager to get into it. So while we do huffa about aliens quite a bit, whether it be something a little bit more optimistically grounded in something like Area 51 or something where it's like, okay, I don't know if aliens are really the answer here. There is actually some interesting thought behind this particular angle. So I do like that Jillian put, we have to do it, aliens. That's the first line. Yeah, do so it. this is a subject that's been considered by Dr. Boyajan's team, though as a last resort. So it is something that they're actually considering <laughs> Yeah. As an answer to the dimming. F-type stars like Tabby's are theorized to be hospitable to planets, meaning that life could form, at least exist near one. They're not overly hot, overly bright, overly radiation heavy. Not that that should stop a lot of life, uh, just hours. Though Kepler did not detect anything close to the star, whether it be life or are there planets around this star? Do we know? No. Oh, they don't detect any planets. Okay. So if aliens were involved, it would have to be some sort of mega structure. That's where this is kind of coming from. Ooh. Yeah. The purpose of the structure is up to speculation, but more theories revolve around energy collection and satellites. So this is where the sub theory that I'm aware of is a Dyson sphere, or in this case in particular, what's called a Dyson swarm. So before I dive into the notes, I'll give it to you from me. 
A Dyson Sphere is a hypothetical item that a Type 2 civilization would use in order to harness the full energy of a star. Sun, yeah. Think about your solar panels that you may have in your home, you've seen around, or whatever. Now think, you took your star and you lined it with solar panels. Just a, a pokeball of solar panels capturing the sun. Yeah. And so literally every ounce of energy is being captured in some way. That is the hypothetical Dyson Sphere. There are many forms of it. If you Google it, some are like multiple rings around it. Some of it are like mirrors that capture it and send it somewhere. There's many forms. But in this case, a Dyson Swarm is the idea of moving parts or drones or spaceships or in some way putting a bunch of panels around it, but they can all move, which would, I'm imagining they're saying swarm because of the irregularity of the dimming. It's not consistent. Interesting. Why would you want to move? I mean, I guess it, I guess if there's an occasional sunspot or certain flare-ups or something, or like, why would you want to move, you know? Yeah. It all depends on its purpose. So after the paper, the concept of a Dyson Swarm was presented. Dyson Swarm is a variation of the more famous Dyson Sphere. This is a concept originally posited by theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson, hence the name. Theoretically, aliens, or possibly humans in the future, we may never know, might settle on a planet or a moon, and eventually as their population grew, so would their energy needs. They would need to expand past their planet. It's something that even now, we might not need tomorrow, but even now, humans are kind of postulating, like, yeah. ideas on how to expand our footprint, but also expand our energy needs. And kind of coming back to the idea of types of civilizations, there's the Kardashev scale, which kind of tries to anticipate intelligent species beyond us. There's type 1s. I think we're considered, like, type 0.5 or something as humans. But type 1 civilizations can harness the full power of their planet, efficiently and everything with minimal losses, right? Like solar panels are very inefficient, for example. Type 2 can directly consume the energy of a star, most likely through, like, again, a Dyson Sphere. And then type 3 civilizations are wicked. I mean, I wouldn't want to meet one unless they were kind, but basically they would be an entity that could harness the power of a galaxy. Jeez. Yeah, such, oh man, this list such as every star or black hole to pull it. I pull up the wiki just to make sure I have it right. But yeah. Oh, I just love the thought of that. And you started things off with like we're a 0.5. I'm like, how? Mm -hmm. How the? How are we a 0.5? We're, we're barely on the scale. Uh, yeah. And then, and then, and then uh, you explain the rest. I went, oh, that's, that makes a lot of this, sense. It, the scale starts after us, uh, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> um, but coming back to my notes, Jillian's got like the idea of the, the sphere is kind of like the shell again, but she also expands on the fact that the swarm would look more like a net. So to help provide the visual, you can imagine a Dyson Sphere being that kind of Pokeball with maybe a few slats open so that way planets can get their natural light and normal geographical things can happen on various planets that need the sun or stars. But a swarm, I'll give you an image here, looks more like a mesh, a 3D oh. mesh of like a basketball. Yeah, yeah. So that way you can still tap the power of the sun, but with very minimal... Impact uh, on yeah. surrounding planets. Yeah. Right. So instead of like, what was it in Tomorrow Never Dies? Is that the one with Halle Berry? Pierce Brosnan? Where they uh, have like a space yeah, laser? So. Like they were basically, they sent up giant mirrors into the sky so they could turn night into day. And it's like this, this whole like Dyson sphere, like that's just a super micro baby version of it. Yeah. Where like all these yeah. mirrors could like angle the angle sun. The sun and, and so you could have point. year round farms, but then they concentrated it into this death beam and then chased yep. James Bond down yeah, the they cliff. Did. Yes, they did. Jeez. It was Die Another Day. Die, die another, another Day. day. Which one did I say? Tomorrow, tomorrow never, dies? never Dies? Man, there's always tomorrow and death in it. I think Madonna did the intro for Die Another Day. Dun, 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 dun. Die another day. Another day. day. Yep. <laughs> and not my time to go. So instead of structures like living spaces, these would essentially be millions of solar panels harvesting the energy of the star for a hyper-advanced civilization to maybe, I don't know, spitballing run the matrix yeah to simulate what an earth-like planet would look like with people that do podcasts yeah i mean it could be it, it could not be aliens in, in the traditional sense it could be a, like advanced right. robotics right this could just be a super advanced civilization doing their thing yeah somewhere in the universe and we just happen to go wait a minute why is that star getting all dim they're like oh our bad 
That's just us. <laughs> yeah. We're just living our lives. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've got a chimney smoke coming up off our planet, and they're going, "What's that smoke over there?" Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. We're catching up. We're a we're a point well, yeah, five. Yeah. Like, oh, look at the little baby. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, we're a two. Okay, my bad." Now, in October of 2015, the SETI Institute requested that the Allen Space Telescope be pointed towards Tabby. Basically, they were looking for any signs of life. If there's going to be a Dyson swarm out there, then there's going to be spaceships, planets that are being inhabited. You're going to be able to see things like exhaust. There might be forms of communication, whether it be light or radio waves or x-rays or some way, something unique being detected. And then you might have a signal with a certain rhythmic pattern in it, which would indicate, again, a intelligently formed signal, i.e. life or communication. Man, I really don't know if we should be reaching out and sending signals. I'm sure we are, though. Just oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, oh, yeah. Are we, yeah, we're constantly projecting like... All of our old broadcast radio TV waves are out there. They're just way out there. Ever since TV went live, it's been sending it out from our planet. Jeez. Yeah. Dangerous. But after two weeks of looking, the Allen telescope did not detect any radio emissions. It's hard to say that two weeks is enough time. But It really is. But if we're watching it happen now... And, you know, God, that's just like, that's just the weird thing about it. It's so far away that it's in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You, you really got to think about it as not in the terms of light is fast. We think see things instantly. You got to think of it in terms of, I sent you a carrier pigeon with what was in the news today. And Pretty when much. you got it, it was, like, you're like, I knew this. Yeah. You know, this happened 50 years ago, but instead it takes years and years and years and it's light data. God. That's so fascinating. I love that theory, though. I, I would love for that to be true. Sunspots seems a little bit more accurate, but I guess we'll find out when James Webb points at it. All right, the final theory we're going to talk about. One of Dr. Boyajian's leading hypotheses was a circumstellar dust ring surrounding Tabby's star. A circumstellar dust ring could be a ring of ice or dust around Tabby's star, similar to the asteroid belt in our solar system. The dimming of the star is more pronounced in ultraviolet light than infrared, ooh, based on data from NASA's Spitzer. Oh, okay. So it dims more on the UV side of the spectrum than it does on infrared. Infrared just basically being visible heat. So it stays hot, but it dims ultra... Interesting. I, dude, I don't even know what could cause that. Yeah. So according to studies in 2017, Hua Meng of the University of Arizona the dust is more visible in short blue wavelengths. This is due to the selective scattering effect of small particles, which is what makes the sky blue. If you never notice that, you never really see blue as part of the sunrise or sunset. We rarely see green. That's why you get the little green blip on the Pacific right when the sun sets. You get a little of green. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. that's like the last light to hit our eyes. But yeah, interesting. So essentially, what the sun does in our atmosphere turns into blue and we see that the tabby star is doing with potentially an orbiting dust cloud around it and so a similar effect is happening whoa that's wild so that's so why would ultraviolet be more blocked probably shorter wavelengths more easily blocked than infrared maybe i don't know i'm just thinking out loud okay so coming back to the theory so the objects may be relatively small and that would explain the irregularities similar to the comet slash exoplanet theory because the dust particles are microscopic and the ring itself could just be this cloud, but still an uneven cloud. Recent observations suggest this is the most likely explanation, such as the Spitzer and Swift telescope missions. However, scientists don't know where the dust particles are coming from. It could be from a gas planet thousands of years ago, and we are just seeing the last of its consumption by Tabby's star, or the remnants of an alien battle. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I love it. <laughs> Bro, uh, we were going on a, a, a track and then that I, just swerved straight into a wall. I can see I can see Jillian now typing away and like smirking as this last line comes out. But Or the remnants of an alien battle and the destruction of a planet as mentioned in Dr. Boyajian's TED Talk. So, that was from Dr. Boyajian. Mm -hmm. I do the idea like of how a Dr. Boyajian... This is where Star Wars happened. <laughs> Del, like dives into what could just be the uh, considered the outlandish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that, man. I so that that's the kind of final big theory with the meat on the bone. But 
I'm so eager for this thing to be looked at by our I most know. recent telescope. I know. Give us more data. Oh my God. But I'm also so fascinating that I'm like, as we were talking about episode ideas, which we do like every few months, we'll like plan out the next handful of months. And this was on the list. And I'm like, I think this is really fascinating, but maybe we do a space themed episode, do a couple mini mysteries. Cause just from like not knowing it very well, I was like, man, it, it feels like it could be answerable or, or not as interesting, but like the fact that even the scientists are going, I mean, it really could be yeah. something yep. pretty fantastic, pretty outlandish. It could be that Star Trek stuff. Part of me wants it to be that. Cause I'm like, that's just neat. But what if it is? And we go, why haven't they let it? Hey, what? Hey, <laughs> hey, neighbor. And they're like, oh, God, they spotted us. <laughs> Man, suddenly the star disappears and you're like, oh, God. It could be like Star like Trek. Us. You know what I mean? Like, just don't mess with, <laughs> don't mess with the growth of that civilization. Hey, we're ready now. We're, re we're all eagerly <laughs> waving our hands. You know, hey, we're ready. Our giant, just like, they just don't giant know. They don't know. They don't know. The information we give them would blow their minds, literally. Yeah, they go, uh, nobody's home. They turn off the star. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dang it. Ah. Man. I'm just like, I think this is so cool. And one thing that stands out to me is that there's a lot of ancient civilizations of this planet that knew a lot about the stars. I mean, they, we look back with our, our technology and we think, oh, how advanced we are. It must mean that the past civilizations couldn't have been advanced, i.e. not as knowledgeable, but it's, it's been heavily shown just how much, for example, ancient Egyptians or Mayans have known yeah. about the solar system and about the stars and the planets that we just kind of kept rediscovering. The fact that we have Tabby's star as a mystery that's been dimming, but only in recent history is wild to me because that is absolutely something that the Mayans could yeah. have known about or would have known about. And that's either lost information or this is a, an event that has only really started happening in the yeah. recent few centuries, which to me is all the more intriguing and just makes me want it to be a Dyson sphere all the more because if it's, if it's a gas cloud I mean that's who's to say that that just starts up in the last hundred years that's kind of I mean coincidence happen all the time that's why I wanted space mysteries this is so many different things with so many different factors there was and, a and, and just the, the theories and then you started to get into scientific theses like mm -hmm. it just, it just spirals in a great way oh yeah there was another one that I think might have led us to this and I haven't found much on it since but it's only one that I know by by the hook by like a paragraph of information which is that at some point in time somebody witnessed and it was documented and it kept going like multiple stars across the night sky blinking kind of in tune with each other and these would be stars that could not feasibly be near each other but they were blinking almost randomly but in cadence with each other until they just stopped and that was a mystery that we really couldn't find much on, but it was one that I was like fascinated by. And that's something that actually happened. How's that not aliens? I know, right? How's that not? I know. That or it's the simulation saying, wake up, wake True. up. True. Dang. Would you be upset to find out this was all simulation? No, I might, I might be relieved. There's things I'd be upset about. Yeah. Like, okay, well, my boy Fredo, Christian, are they real? Are they also plugged in? Is my partner, Barbara, is she real? Can I go see her in her little pod and our naked slug bodies can like hug again? True. Or was it just me? Was it just you? Was I a sentient software? Like all of those things would be interesting. That's true, right? But like who among the three of us would be real? If any, mm -hmm. we could just be a part of what is a simulation for someone else. I, I mean, even beyond that, <laughs> since since we're on the space one and since we're on the back end, we're just going to be hanging task force. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for allowing us to indulge in such a wide variety of topics. Thank you for allowing us to geek out on stuff like this. Man, these are, these are some of my favorites. Yep. But I think just to end with a thought that I think is very profound. We're talking about space. We're talking about like what could be out there, the, the infinite possibilities. And I think it's so beautiful. If this isn't a simulation, I think there's something beautiful there in that we are pieces of the universe that are self-aware. For example, to make it even more real and more weird, the brain is an organic piece of matter that has named itself. And it is just a piece of floppy universe yep. that has come together. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a star, a rock, and a human? Not much other than how it operates. And so we, we are literally sentient pieces of this universe. 
Yeah. And then when you die, you just kind of flow back into it. You just de decompose and become a tree, and then the tree burns and you go to the sky and become stars. I don't know if, enough about stars, but I feel like that's how they're born. Yeah, burnt trees. <laughs> <laughs> but then the planet blows up, and then the star blows up, and that forms a new star, and then that forms new planets. So you know what I mean? Like, these atoms that are you have been around for billions of yeah, years. and will become something else. So you say you're 30 years young, I say you're 13 billion years old. <laughs> it's I time to retire. I send myself into a black hole. <laughs> Jeez. Then you just get spit out into another one. That was my, as a kid, that was my theory. I was like, what if, what if you just get like, you don't come out alive, but you get atomized or even down to like the cork yeah. parts of an atom. And then you just get spit out into another universe, Probably. right? Or like, or like on the opposite end of a black hole is just another big bang that's happened, right? True. What is <sighs> that even? Yeah, I don't even know. Hard to comprehend. But Task Force, thank you all so much for listening. This has been Tabby Star. Any final closing thoughts? Profound musings, Christian? I don't know why you're asking me for any profound musings. It's We're not in what it. I'm known for. It. We're in it now. You're the chair. You got four legs. You must have four <laughs> minds. Uh, I just am going to echo what Alfredo said earlier. Space is wild, man. <laughs> Space is wild. Fredo, wild any now. parting thoughts? Space beeth big. <laughs> Dang. He made it profound. There you go. go I said it in layman's terms, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah. You gotta have both flavors. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish we had Jillian in here, but otherwise, Fredo, I'll see you right back here next week for yet another mystery. Mm -hmm.